in a weekend where there was lots of fun, controversy and peak Barclays Premier League action, there was great news for one team and they were definitely happy to see the result went their way. 4-1, great scoreline. This is One Kick from Glory and we're back and we've got the crew all here today. We've got Craig, yeah, Matthew's yeah. back in the building. What's up? Matt, Mark sends his regards and we're going to start off with that game at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Has many other names, but we'll call it that for now. <laughs> Chelsea versus Tottenham. Matthew, <laughs> lots to talk about in that one. Um, <laughs> but let's just get your general thoughts on how that game went from your perspective. Where do you even start, man? Words can't even describe how the the, the emotions, the time, just the, the camaraderie, and just sometimes why you put you put it all on the line to just love football so much, even if it's for the first few moments it's not going your way. I, I wouldn't have predicted that in any way, shape or form, not just the result, but just how the game went with the stop starts, the goals, the this, the that, the, the, the aggro. There's something about, in key moments, with, with a Spurs and Chelsea game, which just brings out the beast in both of these, te both of these teams. And that's exactly like what happened and what and we needed this win we absolutely needed this win after a disappointment at Brentford not getting the results against you guys this was the one that we really needed but boy did we make an absolute journey of it like it's almost as if from the first goal and the first few tackles there was a something just like we just grabbed a horn a little bit and just like now this this means something let's start Let's start playing. Let's start getting in their faces. And granted, we've got the, the ball in the net a couple of times. It was offside, but you saw the shift in the attitude. And even when they were sort of hacking at our players, we stood firm. You know, and these are young guns as well. These are young boys. You know, like some of them are unfamiliar of how important this game's in. But, you know, they recognise that this is something that we really need. So a lot of these young guys stepping up. Jackson stepping up. Palmer stepping up. Mm. Um, Gallagher stepping up, you know, not forgetting, forgetting the generals, like, you know, like your Sterlings and things like that. The, the, uh, Thiago Silva is reminding us of like, the experience and the mix of the youth. And no, it was the youth that got the goals. It was the youth that kind of stepped up. And, you know, granted it was nine men, but yeah, you beat what's in front of you. They saw just finding that kind of mental strength, which is what has been lacking so much in this team. To then go ahead and do the job. Jackson gets his hat trick, I mean, like this, if this doesn't kick him on, I don't know what will, but it was just unbelievable. Of course, there was frustration there. There's always going to be frustration in a game like this. VAR doing its best to, to test my nerves and test my heart on the school night, but well, it's always going to be a discussion. But wow, what a night. Well, probably the best Monday night football we've had in the modern times, I'm going to say, not that I'm biased because it's my team, I'm going to say it's the best Monday night football ever. Like in, in modern times, at least, it's like it was un, un in modern times. In modern times, it depends what year you count as modern times. Because I, I can, t I, like, without even being able to think of exact games, I know we've had more eventful Monday night footballs. But what I will say is that obviously this game is coming in the background of all the controversy off the back of the Arsenal Newcastle result, and we will talk about that a little bit later on. But and and also like the the kind of media for all that's been surrounding for all season, especially in light of the comments made by Mikel Arteta post-game and, of course, Arsenal backing up his, his stemmings. I think for you, Craig, when you look at how the game kind of panned out in, like, the first sort of... the first 30 minutes, do you feel like that cloud of attention on VAR, on the referees, do you think that really impacted the judgment, not just of the on-field on -field official, but also the people surrounding them on the background as well? Yeah, I feel that um, because of all the controversy over the weekend, I feel that the man, the, um, obviously Gary, Gary Neville was doing the um, was doing the thing before the game as well. So it was more pressure, more pressure on the referees. So the first decision they made, everything, it was a lot, it was a lot, it was a long break. Everyone was making sure it was getting correctly. The players were surrounding the referee, so the referee was under pressure. They had to make the right decision. I thought, and all the decisions he made in the game were the right decisions, in the game. Well, the red cards, the red cards were a better decision. I think... Rome Romero should have been sent off before he got sent off anyway. That, that's what I was going to say. So it I took a very long time for yeah. it to happen as well. Yes, yeah, so I think for me, my kind of perspective on it all is that the referees and the officials were unwilling to make a decision until they were forced to make a decision. So, like, um, Romero could have gotten 
hooked for a number of tackles. Like, there was kicked, that, that tackle kicked, on the ground. Kicked, yeah, he kicked the guy, yeah. yeah and he mm. stamped out Enzo. Um, not Enzo, he stamped out at... Um, Enzo Bob. was one of them. It was someone else. Uh, Enzo was the tackle in the box, which he got, they got the penalty for. Yeah. The dogie for that two-footed lunge at the ball. That should have yeah. been a red card. Which should have been a red card without having to go to VAR. Yeah. But that only became a yellow card and then nothing happened. When he in the you. second tackle, he knew that no VAR needed for yeah. that. And he just so I think for me, there was just a refusal to just make a decision. And, and that in and of itself is part of the problem with VAR this season, is that referees on the pitch are seemingly not making a call because they believe VAR would bail them out. And then VAR on the flip side are not pulling up refereeing mistakes because they want to make their friends feel affected. And it's something that was been, has been admitted by Mike Dean when he was on Sky Sports, um, I think a couple months ago, where he said that, you know, there's decisions that happened in a game when he was in VAR and he didn't want to upset his mate. Affect your friend, it, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, at the end of the day, what we want is consistency, we want excellence, and we want there to be a fairness. And you don't get a fairness if there's inherent biases or if referees are doing a friendship, friendship thing. We yeah. don't want to see that. And I think this game did kind of suffer from that initially, like the first 30 minutes. Obviously, we got to that penalty when it all got ch- turned around. But I think what was interesting from a, a fan's perspective, like you said, Matthew, is the rallying result of the performance of Chelsea. I want to highlight two players, or three players in particular, that really, I think, were quite instrumental. One was Bambi on ice, <laughs> Bambi Jackson. Uh, and then the other two are two players who are carrying the English flag and flying it high for Chelsea. Raheem Sterling, who I think had a really, really good game, yeah, kept game. trying um, you know, with his outside to in runs. And then Cole Palmer, who just keeps stepping up. How impressed have you been with those two players and how important was it also for Jackson to get his hat-trick? For Jackson, because he hasn't scored for... A while, yeah. No, I think the last time he scored was against Burnley, and he's been hacked off. Um, he hasn't started a lot because the, the results are just too inconsistent. But this hat trick in such a high profile game, you know, because he's got he's he's still raw to the Premier League. I know this is going to be one of those excuses that flies around. He's still raw to the Premier League, like when Drogba first came, like when Adebayor first came, like when Henri first came. They were raw to the Premier League for a time until they got to a point when they were able to, like, flourish. Drogba didn't get it right for, like, two years. I'm not saying he has two years, but he's going to need time to adapt. But results like this, things like this, in a game like this, is going to be something that's giving him a world of confidence, especially with the game we got next against Man City. It's going to be an absolute... That's going to be one of the ultimate tests right before the international break. Going on to our English guns, Cole Palmer particularly, he's like he's getting, he's one of the shining lights in pretty much every game. Even in the Brentford game, he was doing something and he's making himself known. I mean, the confidence to step up and take a penalty when we're one nil down where for all right, he could miss. The confidence he's having is you know, against Arsenal, against Burnley, against Tottenham. He's, he's moving mad. He's doing some real bits and now seeing more of why we bought him. He's such a positive as- asset to the team. He's always trying, but that could have come from the teaching from Pep. He was under Pep for a while. And up until we bought him up, he was at Man City still for some sort of time. So he's picked something up and that winning mentality. He's 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 such a great guy to watch. And when even when you hear him speak after the end of the game, the way they hear, hear him speak, he's confident, he's sure. And above all, I think what this, what this team needs He's disciplined. He sounds like he has been disciplined for some time from a very young age. And that hopefully can spread to a lot of the other players. With Sterling, like, as an experienced guy who knows what it's about and knows what it means, you're always going to look at him as, you know, like the guy to kind of drag up sort of thing. I always look at him, I almost look at him as like a second leader, you know, sometimes in this team. And again, just delivering when we... He's a funny one because he can he does it when we need him to and we need him to in that game because if we lost, we're sinking further down the table and going way, way back. Um, I just hope, but this is all in preparation for the next game coming up against Man City. Again, it's going to be an absolute, it's a massive one because it's a new Chelsea from last time. He's a, he's be, he's already a better player this year than when he was last year and he first came for us. So, absolute. Those three players, I think are going to be vital not just for the next game, but for the games are things like and Central Break as well. So, but no, I mean, this has given me hope, it's given me confidence, but only if we can pick up some kind of performance or result in the next game. Okay. So I'm not going to be flying off the party poppers just yet. 
I'm not saying I'm not even grateful for it because I am. But let's we move on to the next game. Start afresh from from yesterday, Tuesday, prepping for this game. Let's see what we can do in another big, big game. Because if you, if you think of all the big teams we played, like so of Arsenal, Spurs, and Liverpool, we haven't lost. So clearly, against the bigger teams, there's something there. So let's see how we can do against the best of the best. That is that is the challenge and that is the opportunity. I think one thing I will say, and I'll ask for this to you as well, Craig, is obviously looking at the game itself, you, you ended up winning 4-1. Mm. That is a really good result. But what was quite interesting in the second half when they were down to nine men, like with a bit of better technical execution, you could have probably scored 15 goals out there. Mm. I think four was definitely like flattering to them. And, and a bit of a sign of the, the like the immaturity in your team. Do you think, Craig, that Chelsea need to look at the technical level of their squad and improve it? Because I think a lot of times, if you look at that, that high line that Tottenham were playing, and we're going to talk about that in a second as well, <laughs> absolute naivety and arrogance of them, but it looked like it was there for the killing and they didn't quite do enough. Like they got four goals, but they could have got 10, 15, with how badly Tottenham were defending. What do you think about that? I agree. If they're playing like a Man City with nine men, or a Liverpool with nine men, or even a Brentford with nine men, they would have got back. They would have scored more goals. I think Chelsea is still their young team, that their inexperience up front. If they had like a maybe even in Kuko's up front, maybe he would have bagged more than the four you guys got, or even a Giroud or even anybody else up front, they would have bagged goals for fun. So I feel yeah. that. I thought that, yeah. It felt like a missed opportunity. Like there was definitely a lot more goals out there. And and we'll, we'll talk about Mr. Mr. Honest Man, <sighs> Ange. Uh, I'm honest, you know. I respect the referee's decision, but weren't you the same guy that ran down the touchline and got booked during the game for not respecting the referee's decision? But I've stopped being a hypocrite in it. Like we know it. You you want to be the media darling, and everyone's talking about how you're different to Arteta. But at the end of the day, he didn't get booked against Newcastle. You did. That is all I have to say about that. But um, do you think, uh, I'll first you first, Craig, and then you, Matthew, do you think that Tottenham's stubbornness in their tactical approach will be something that will bite them on the bum later on down the season? Because he refused to change how they played. They played a high line with Eric Dyer. Eric Dyer, who has been outrun by Olivier Giroud in his career, says, all you need to know about that guy, but they kept a high line. Do you think that was just naivety, which will become a problem? It's arrogance. Mm. They were arrogant. They thought, oh, we'll, 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 we'll hit them on a counter-attack. And bearing in mind, that was 1-1 at the time. They kept that. They, they were arrogant, honestly. They thought they were going to hit them on a the counter-attack. If they were playing against a better team, no disrespect to Chelsea, if they were playing against a better team with a better quality of players, they would have got destroyed. Imagine you running against Eric Dyer, or you running against Emerson Royale, or Pedro Porro, or whoever was at left back. <laughs> it would have been a, a, a field day. But what if I have to say, though, their goalkeeper saved some. Their goalkeeper, gets, to give him credit, he was their man of the match, the goalkeeper. He made some top class saves. He was, he was a sweeper keeper. Mm. Every time the ball went inside, he was coming out of his goal, coming out of his line, sweeping the ball. But he knew, man. He knew he was their best player. He was their best player. He made some good saves. He's a, he's a good replacement for Luis anyway, so. Um, but on this side, I thought that they were very arrogant and they're very um, they 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 could have got battered even more. I thought that if that if, if that happens to them again and they go on to nine men again in the game this season, and if they get a much more better goal scoring team, they will get destroyed. Pretty much indeed. We're gonna move over to from the white and blues to the white and reds. Liverpool, Luton Town, one one draw. Kenilworth Road, very, very unlucky for Luton. Uh, in fact, what I found quite interesting is a Burnley fan said, um, he's quite a known uh, YouTuber, he was saying that um, even though he was happy for the draw, because of how Luton performed, he feels like Burnley might not stay up because he saw a lot more fight in Luton than he would see in Burnley, which it's... You know, considering how well Burnley performed last season compared to Luton to come up, that's quite astounding. Um, but fair play to Liverpool to get that that draw. Um, I guess for you, Matthew, how important is it for Luton to have that confidence of knowing that they went, they held Liverpool, went ahead in the 80th minute, 
And it's only the 90th plus five minute, 95th minute when Luis Diaz got the equaliser. Mm. Obviously, we'll, we'll touch on Diaz in a bit, but how important do you think that is for Luton Town to have done that well to battle and get ahead? That is no mean feat. It's no mean feat. I mean, and cr- I think even after the result they got, they can hold, they can walk away with their heads held high. They put in work for that point. And they you won't, they deserve the three points. But I think we said before, I think I've said this like weeks like weeks in the past, their home form is going to be so vital. Mm. Absolutely vital. And if they can do that against Liverpool, you probably think they can they're gonna do that against literally anyone. Granted. I think they already had some home games where they lost, but in particular for games like Liverpool's, your Arsenal's, your City's, Chelsea's, Spurs, United's, they're the ones they're going to want to pick up something and they're going to turn up big time for that because they're the ones almost like they're expecting to lose. But it's like, ah, oh, we can get something from... E-. Can you imagine in, like, say, six or seven games they pick up either a win or a loss in every other game? Sorry, a win or a draw in every other game. That's at least... That's more than 10 points. That's more than 10 points, so they're going to be absolutely vital. They're going to make it uncomfortable. It was a November night, early early dark, cold, not like the glamour of Anfield. It's a small, intimate stadium where you hear everything, you feel everything, you smell everything. And these fans, for all, what, nine, ten thousand 10,000 of them, you're going to hear every single word. You're going to feel every single breath that these fans are going to give you, and they will make you feel uncomfortable. Lionel Messi could come to the stadium and they would make him feel absolutely uncomfortable while he puts three past their keeper. But the point <laughs> still stands is like their home games are going to be so vital. And like you said, they've been more impressive than Burnley have been. Way more impressive. Plus, plus, I may want to remind you, Luton have done something for Sheffield. I think that Sheffield United, uh, I don't know if Burnley have done yet. They've got an away win. They got one away win so far this season. On top of, I think they've got at least one home win. Um, have, they, have, they, have they got an away at home win yet? Or I'm not sure. Uh, they got I'm they got sure a home draw. I'm not sure, but they're not going to be. They're going to go down, but they're not going to go down without. A, yeah, not, they're going down, but not without a fight. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, they're, I, not I gonna make on, it, they're not going to make it easy. I was on that train for a while, but I, I don't know anymore. They're, they're going to fight. They are going to fight. Hell, even against when we played them back in August, they weren't. They didn't go down dying. It took a while to kind of put them down. So they're that kind of club that they're going to they're going to fight. They really are going to fight. But it was a great game, and they can walk away proud. So, so they, they haven't won a game this season. Have they not? At all. No. They have drawn one, two. Three draws and the rest are all defeats. Really? Yeah. Oh, Sheffield United. Well, never mind. But anyway, like, talking about Luton, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, they haven't been. No like, but they're gonna make it. They're gonna make it tough. They're gonna make it tough. So, but, so it was a great. It was a great game as well. Great game. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously the the, the background of course Liverpool perspective is Luis Diaz's dad got kidnapped in Colombia, so that's really sad, and hopeful that he will be released soon. But it's good of him to get off get off the bench and get the equaliser. And actually what was quite nice is um, Luton Town's social media, they posted the full highlights and had an extended bit at full time of the players all hugging Luis Diaz. And you could really tell that from the football family, you know, fully behind him and hopeful that can be resolved very quickly. But I mean, from a professional point of view, that's that's what you want. He came on on the 83rd minute for Gavin Birch, got the equaliser. Liverpool are looking quite good in the table. They're on 24 points. Three behind the leaders, Man City. Two behind Tiny Tots. Uh, level with us. Level on goal difference too. But probably scored more goals than us, so that's why they're ahead. So they look quite good. How do you think they're shaping up Craig this season? They're looking all right, but I, feel, I still think they're lacking a centre mid and, and a clinical striker because Nunes, that miss on Sunday was terrible. It was a shocking. Mm. Salah played all across it. All they had to do was just side foot it. Side foot it over the bar. It's a couple of times this season he's missed an open goal. He missed an open goal in the Europa League game. Did all the good work, got to the goal line, hit the... Oh. The funny thing with him is, like, it, it's... And they are not, in no means similar strikers, but I do remember with Adebayor in his first year, or his first two years, actually, for us, because, yeah, he, was, he started in the 04, 04 or 05, last season at Highbury. 05, 06. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember. And was, then 06, yeah. 07, it was still, like, it was still very inconsistent. 
mm. 07, 08, it all can click together. And I think with Nunes, when you look at him, because he's doing everything else right, bar the finish, when he gets one in, he'll probably go on a run of like six games and mm. score every match. That's just what I see happening. Yeah, but yeah. it's just right now, yeah. it's just that inconsistent part. Yeah, he, he has been in good form. He did all well this season. He came off the bench against Newcastle, scored two goals to win the game when it was out of 10 men. He scored in the Europa League. He scored what? He's got a cracking goal in the League Cup last week as well against Bournemouth. So he, he's got all the ingredients to be a top striker, elite striker. So we'll see what he can do. But Liverpool are looking all right. I feel they, they've they lost some key players in the summer. They lost their captain. They lost their lost Fabinho. They lost. Um, Cater left. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd say no, this. No. I think Fabinho fell off a cliff anyway from last season, mm-hmm. so there's not a loss there. As for Henderson, well, less said the better. Mil- Milner left. He yeah. was a good engine. No, listen, so he's had an experience. Yeah. They've lost a lot. But I, but, thought, I thought they've got a young... Gavin Burks looks like he's going to be a top player for them. Yeah. They're, just, they're missing a DM. That's what I'm saying. They need another DM. That's it. Can I say this? No, can I say no. Lavia should have gone there. Mm. We're going to get game time at Chelsea. I don't know why he's at he's Chelsea. Still in, he's still injured. It doesn't matter. When he's fit, he's not going to start. He's not going to get minutes. <laughs> he's got Enzo ahead of him. He's got... Caicedo. Caicedo. He's got Gallagher, Gallagher ahead of him. He's got the dude in Jose way. If you can't... If you got your well, you can't have him. No one can have him. Nah, I'll be all right. Wait, he'll come back. He'll, he'll, he'll come back. He's still got to work his way into the kind of fold. Because we're, the, we're, 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 we're training for two teams here. Because the idea is that by the end of the season, we're going to be back in Europe. So... We're gonna have two like different sets of teams for cup. What what, what Europe are you qualifying for? Europa League, yeah, or huh? Conference League? We're back in the Champions League. We'll see about we're that. We're already we're, we're in better shape. Champions League. You are nine really? points behind the Champions League places. I ain't friend. worried. I ain't worried. Okay, we'll three see. Three wins. Yeah, but it requires everyone in the Champions League place to have three losses. Like I said, I ain't worried. All right, I'm, All right. No, I'm not worried. I think I think Europa is calling you. I'm I'm cool, man. I'm, I'm cool. not sure which one, but I'm Europa cool. Hey, listen. We've won the Champions League. We've won in the Europe, the the Europa League. Let's do the conference. Let's let's complete the set. Complete. Be the first club to do it. Complete the set. Why? With a young squad. So why not, man? Why not? We'll yeah. see. We'll see what happens. If there's, if there's a trophy out there, I want it. Well, definitely, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. It's, it's a long way to go. Um, yeah, I think we, like we said, Liverpool are in a good shape. I think it's definitely shaping up nice for them. And I think with Nunes, it's, it's not a thing that the fans should be worried about because he's doing all the good stuff. It's just the finishing's not quite there. But he's getting um, better from when he was last year. Yeah. He's, last year, he was real. That's the thing. He's getting better. Mm. You can see that. Yeah. Speaking of our team that's getting better, Sheffield United, 2-1 win against Wolves. They finally secured three points. They're still rooted to the bottom of the league, but they're level on points with Burnley. They're staring up Bournemouth and Luton Town. So, Sheffield United and Burnley are both on four points. Bournemouth and Luton Town are both on six points. Everton are on 11 points, which looks good right now. But as you know, we were saying before we start recording, that looming points deduction for financial fair play regularities might drag Everton into a very, very precarious situation. So, they need to start getting wins and fast because they are not... If they're going to end up like Derby when when Nuno was in charge, yeah. when they had that, was it 12 point or 15 point docked? It's, it's tough. 50, yeah. And he almost pulled it off. He almost pulled it off, but, you know, this wasn't to be. But Sheffield United, late win. Uh, another late, late penalty for them. Molly Norwood getting the winner. How important will that be for them this season and their prospects? Well, it was a home. Like, with all the promoted teams, with Luton, with uh, with Burnley, with Sheffield United, especially someone like Sheffield United, that Bramall Lane, which is notorious for being tough, it means a lot. It's late, better late than never. Hopefully, this could be the thing to kind of give them, give them like some kind of confidence. But if they can turn this round and even end up 17 somehow, that would be that would be insane. Because I think now the growing the list of teams that are gonna be fighting for a survival grows every single time. Just because form is just the, the form down there is just so unpredictable. Un- unpredictable. One minute, but Brentford were there one minute, and now they're up to the top half of the table. You know, West Ham were fighting way up near the top four. They're now down 11th. You just, I'm not saying they're going to get relegated, but you just don't know. Plus, with the Everton points deduction, this, never mind the top four race in the Europe race, the relegation race is looking like already like it's going to be something that's going to be damn near almost impossible to predict. Mm. So, like with, like, like with Everton, they need to get some results and quick. Yeah, it's, it's a big ask, and they're going to need to keep picking up those points. Obviously, for Wolves, it's another disappointing result, another disappointing outcome. Um, but I think Gary O'Neill's got them doing good stuff. 
So I think they should be okay. What's your thoughts on how it's going for Wolves this season and just another another disappointing uh, result? I think, I think Gary Newell will keep them up this season. They've done well. They, they beat Man City. They could have beaten United in the first game of the season. They're very unlucky. Um, They've they, been robbed by VAR. Yeah, a big day has been. Mm. I thought I thought that they they're doing all right. And I thought that like, Gary O'Neill has experience of keeping Bournemouth up last season. Wolves were in a similar predicament last season. They had a relegation zone and their manager before on um, Gary O'Neill kept them up. I feel like they're gonna they, they they lost a lot of key players in the summer. They lost Raheem Jimenez. They lost um, Neves to Saudi Arabia. I lost uh, Jimenez to Fulham. So they sort of and Torore has gone to Fulham as well. So they lost a lot of their key players. So now. They're just rebuilding as a transitional season for them. So they step up the season, it'll be a good season for them. And you, you yeah. forgot one key player, um, uh, Matthias Nunez to Man City. Um, yeah. 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 Wow. They got a good result against Newcastle, though. They got mm. a draw, so. I think they'll stay up. Definitely they'll stay up this season. Yeah, I'm not worried about Wolves in the relegation fight. I think them, Fulham, will figure it out and keep pulling away. It's, it's the Everton, Luton Town, Bournemouth, Burnley, and Sheffield. Maybe Nottingham Forest might get dragged into it, but I, I don't know. Some well, teams you just think they'll just be okay. I think, New, I think Nottingham Forest have bought, have bought well this summer as well. They've bought some quality players and they've got winners in their team, so I thought they'd be all right. Yeah. They need to sort out their away form. Okay. The home form is quite good, just the away form is a bit shaky. So. A good manager as well. Yeah, Steve mm-hmm. Cooper's a good manager. So he knows yeah. what to do. And he's doing what needs to be done, and that, that's really important. Um, before we get to Arsenal, because we all have a lot to talk about Arsenal. Let's first talk about the other team that we're red in the league, Manchester United. <sighs> Three points. Fergie time FC. Fergie time FC. <laughs> I mean, it was a 90th plus one minute, so it wasn't that late into extra time. But, you know, they, they did have one goal chalked off, which, to be honest with you, I, I think they could have given the first goal. Mm. I don't think there was enough in it yeah. to say that's definitely... Was it offside the game before? Was it a... F- Big man with oh, interfering, off. wasn't it? Yeah, interfering, the playing, yeah. But it wasn't. If we're calling that into VAR again, I mean, that, that, was, <laughs> I, that one I thought, okay, they're clutching it. I mean, okay, yeah, he does move towards the ball, but like. Uh, it wasn't in Leno's way. Leno could have saved it anyway. Yeah. So it I wasn't think it's because he moved to try and yeah. get the ball, but either way, I, I think that one I say is, is very soft, but probably deservedly offside. And then, of course, they, you know, Fernandez stepped up with the goods again. Um, but yeah, I mean, for you, Craig, how do you see things going with Man United? See, Man United is one of them teams here. Like they, 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 they lose a couple of games. Their manager's under pressure, and and some players will just dig dig the manager out of a hole. And I think Bruno Fernandez dig this manager out of a hole because they lost against Fulham. It would have been very peak for the manager. I'm telling you that for sure. Mm-hmm. And I thought that he 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 led by example. Man United are always known whenever they have a crisis. Man United are always known as a club whenever they're in crisis. They always seem to find a way to dig themselves out of a crisis and get on, go on mm-hmm. form. So now they now they won this game. That should give them confidence to win the next couple more. They've got Luton next at home. I'm guaranteed they should get three points in that game. The Champions League tonight. The Champions League tonight against Copenhagen. If they win that, then they can try and salvage second place in the group. I bet Biden that um, Bayern Munich beat Galatasaray. Mm. So I feel that if they can... Try and push up the table, get a couple more because they're six points behind Arsenal now in the league. So mm-hmm. if they can push up, maybe they can start challenging for the top four, not win the title because I think they're two way behind for that right now. But at least they can get into the top half of the table, top four. Then we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely a lot of work to be done, and they're, they're you know like in the, the day in the Premier League when you don't play well or when things aren't really going your way, what you need to do is get those three points, and they did that. And like Craig said, that's going to put them in a good stead going on as the season progresses. I guess for you, Matthew, when you look at May United this, you know, throughout October, let's not even say this whole season, let's just say the month of October, it's been a tumultuous time for them. How important is it for them to kind of get some stability and some normality back? If they want to be where they think they deserve to be, they've they've been, there's a lot of work and a bad month only mask what's really truly going on in behind the scenes at this club. That's where most of their problems lie, is the behind the scenes. It's like a it's like Coronation Street has come to Old Trafford and it's like, we're gonna start directing things. Never mind the Glazers, whoever directs Coronation Street, that's what exactly what they're doing. The back room, like Terry Hag, he's barely got a grip of that squad. 
barely got a grip. He got his, he had a thing with Rashford before the Fulham game. Obviously, we could talk about Sancho, the things going on with Anthony. A lot of players there that shouldn't be there anymore. The players that they should have got in, and the players that are shining bright. How are you going to entice them to stay when you're playing this poorly? Because for every Fulham that you win when you're playing that badly, we can't forget about the midweek against Newcastle. You can't forget the midweek about Newcastle. I think they were, they were pretty much beaten in the first half of the game. I remember seeing the results. They were poor. Absolutely poor. And even against Fulham, they were poor. And But but what's annoying, and like you think you said before, is that they're one of the few teams that can do this and still not be too far from the top. You said they're six points off the top four mm. being this bad. So how much better would, if with, with just a, the right amount with preparation, with the owners who know how to run a football club, and with a harmonious squad, because the players they have aren't bad. They just seems to be, and what has been for a very long time, a split loyalty. And this has been a problem since Jose was there. And he said it before, you know, this is this is what things goes going to happen. So they need to sort their behind in order to all goes out on the pitch. Because so it's... Whenever you hear anything about them, it's always behind the scenes. So many problems there. So what's going on with the owners? What does Ten Hag want from this squad? What is he, what's, the, what's going on with Sancho? Close, tie off all those loose ends, and then maybe you might start seeing way more of an improvement. What's happening with Maguire? What's happening with, with, uh, with Hodgland? Why is Casemiro to September so poor? You know, what's why Martial's still there? Why is Varane not getting minutes? Anymore? Why is Varane not getting minutes? Anthony, the old Anthony saga. What's like, what's what's the deal? McTominay, he's, how is he? Why is McTominay not playing that much more? He's probably the most Man United player in that squad. Why not you basing things around him? And yet, if anything, why not? He's not captain. Well, he started the last two. Yeah. McTominay, so that's the beginning of something. He's starting he's something. Been. And yeah, Fernandez, what's up? What's up? And then, you know, there's an elephant in the room, Mason Mount. <laughs> why did they sign him? Because I, I don't see what he. I can know. I know why they signed him. I know why he went. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, we know why he went, but why did they sign him? Because they're, they the they're, they're the only club that would do it. They did it with Sancho. They did it with all these other players. They look good in the Man United shirt. Same with Sanchez. He looked great in the Man United shirt after about what five minutes in the first match. He's like, nah. I made a mistake. It wasn't he, even the first match, it was the first trading session. Yeah, he could have gone to a place where he was guaranteed a trophy, but no. But no. Where's that? Man City. City. Man City, what's happening? And yeah, I think they, you could have got a guaranteed Premier League. These players look good in the Man United shirt, I'm not going to take that away. But if you compare the trophy cabinet of City between United, it's night and day. It is absolute, from, from the last, what, six, ten? I'm glad you added that caveat in, because they ain't close to Man United, overall. Overall, but in the last yeah. 10 years. In the last 10 years, yeah. Man City have won all the trophies in the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. Yes, in the recent times. In recent in times. Recent times in yeah. re very recent. Very recent but times. But it don't change history. Yeah, it doesn't change history, and that's, I think, what they want to get back to. What was just it? Like, in the Bible, it's in, uh, before, before Christ. <laughs> after Fergie. <laughs> after Fergie. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I think, ultimately, we know with, like, when you think about football teams that transcend football and our global brands or the teams that define football, you will always have Real Madrid, Manchester United, Milan, yeah. AC Milan, Bayern Munich, Bayern Munich, Munich. Liverpool. Possibly Liverpool, but it depends. Mm. But definitely though, and then Juventus, definitely those as a brand, as the brands that are like, these are the clubs when you think about football, beyond football, these guys are there. PSG are never going to get there. That's what Man they want. Man City are never going to get there. That's what they want. Because to get there, you, you need legacy. And they, Man City will not have legacy. They need, to, they need to dominate for the next 20 years mm. to even begin to ask the question, can, can we enter into your little to your club? It's like, no. no. Ajax as well. Yeah, but Ajax in for football... Their, for, their, for their history... Ajax and their... in a football state, when you think outside of football, Ajax are not that. You sure? They're not that. You're not, talking about, you're, you're not talking about a club, you're talking about like a lifestyle. I'm talking about brands. Like when, yeah. when you think about football teams that are beyond just football, like Real Madrid transcend football. Like mm. them, when they signed Beckham, like look at, the, just watching, the, thinking back on Beckham's documentary and looking at the impact that mm. he made commercially for them, they did a tour in Japan yeah. and it was like Beckham and Real Madrid, yeah. not Real Madrid. <laughs> and it was, a play, it was like the two, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I think about brands, you think of players like that. Man United will always have that. They could be the worst performing team in the... And let's think of it, let's be honest. Of all those teams I've mentioned, they are the worst super club of the lot. They are the worst because the, they've 
underperformed the most. They've won the least amount of trophies relative to time period. When I think about like in the last sort of, say, say last six years. Yeah. When you think about Real Madrid, think about um, well not AC Milan because they've also gone through their so Maria and AC Milan have gone through a similar kind of dip, mm. but AC Milan won their domestic title a couple of seasons ago, yep. so they're back. Mm. Um, and they were in the semis last year. Yeah, Bayern Munich are Bayern Munich. They're never not winning something. It's just Champions League's been a couple of years, but they're, they're always close. Mm. You know, Man United have not been close to that for a while. No, since, um, since They've not been close Marin- to the league for a while. Yeah, since Mourinho's been in charge, they've been close in Champions so, League. So yeah. that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's like, that's where they For me, when I think of Man United, I think of one of the biggest clubs in England. Mm. Now, you can argue that. Liverpool can argue that that's fine. That's a good argument to have between them and Liverpool. But they're like that's one of the biggest clubs. They shouldn't be middling in eighth. They shouldn't be oh we're gonna we're gonna make Champions League. No, you should be saying we're gonna be, take the title off you this season. Or we're gonna win the Champions League. Or yeah, you should be yeah. saying we're, we're coming for the Champions League and the Premier League. That should be your conversation. Yeah. Not we're gonna make top four. What's the top four? What is the top? Four? The top four only became a thing because of. Arsenal, Champ- really. Mm. Or, or, or Champions League Champions money. Champions League money. That's yeah. it became a thing. It was all about one and two. No one cared about three and four. For when, a long time, no one cared. When Arsene Wenger and Ferguson were battling for the title. That was it. Wenger and Ferguson were not thinking about finishing It's when fourth. Chelsea came on the scene, that's when fourth became a, a couple of times. It's true. Because, because then it's like Liverpool were challenging with fourth. Everton, not Everton, New, Everton, Newcastle New, New had Arsenal. that one season when they were both going for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's when it became a thing. So when you guys came to, to the table, Prior to that, no one cared about top four. Change the game. Whereas now, they say top six. There is no top six. There is no big six. Yeah. Tottenham ain't won nothing to be cut part of the big six. They only put you in because it looked nice from a marketing perspective. And you had Gareth Bale and you had all this. You made a big <laughs> club, right? It's, there's five clubs that matter, really. And we can argue who they are amongst yourselves, but there's five clubs that matter in this league. And everyone else is just there. <laughs> That's it. And everyone's trying to get into that five. Yeah, here, here. Exclusive, man. Saying all that, let's talk about Arsenal briefly. Uh, absolutely. I mean, let's be honest. We didn't deserve to win. Uh, a draw would have been would have been suffice. Um, but Craig, let's let's talk about the moment that's been a talk of the internet. What's your views on referee Stuart Atwell, the VAR, um, Pratt, and um, Bruno Gimaraes? <laughs> I have a theory about Bruno, but let's... I'll start with Bruno first, then I'll start the VAR afterwards. Go for it. Bruno should be sent off. You can't put your hands on a player's face like that or the elbow mm. the player. You can't do that in the Premier League anymore. Maybe 20 years, maybe in the 50s or 60s you can do that stuff. You can't do that kind of football anymore. Um, the referee was very poor. Very poor. So not be, so not referee for a while. So go down to the lower league and learn, learn, learn from your mistakes. The VAR... Might as well just throw it in the bin. Because against us on Saturday, there was no VAR for us. You can clearly see that Gabriel was being pushed in the back. I'm not going to talk about the ball going off the line and all that because... Well, 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 that should have been a foul there. David Rea, what were you doing, mate? He's always off his line. He never... Where his positioning is, he should have been more closer to the... Yeah, he should have been further back, not yeah. as small yeah. as he was, yeah. Ben White... And Georgina, I blame you guys for the goal as well. Because Georgina is telling, if you look at, I, watched, I saw the video, Georgina is telling Ben White to close him down. You're not, you shouldn't tell him because you go close him down. You're more close to him than Ben White. You close him down and then tell Ben White to cover you to make a 2v1. There's no way we're looking across the board. They'll either block for a corner or they're going for a throw. Mm. They're just standing there. All of them were, all of them in that defence were ball watching. None of them were thinking or engaging. To think, you know what? Let me stop this goal. You can see the goal we lost the game. Arteta's got a lot to answer for because he picked the team. He never, when he makes changes, he never brings on attacking players at the right moment in that game. Mm-hmm. He brought up Shevchenko for Tommy Asu, for Ben White. When he, if you're going for a game, why do you bring on a Nelson who's an attacking midfielder to try and win the game, or bring on Trossard earlier, switch it up a bit? And Kessler is not good away from home. He doesn't score goals. He's hardly scored away for goal for half, Arsenal for a, or a long time. Why are you starting him against Newcastle? If it's not working, you could have played Martinelli through the middle or you could play Trossard through the middle. Try something different. Because it's not working. Bring and on as an impact. So I know he scored a hat trick last week, but he had a stinker against West Ham, had a stinker against Newcastle, and it's like, what we're gonna like I, I think we regret that we never bought another striker in the summer. Or we sold Balogun. In a way we should have kept Balogun because now it's showing that we need another striker. 
I mean, I, I can agree with the striker argument. I don't know about the Balogun argument because I think even he's been very inconsistent for Monaco. And yes, he's a much better player in the box, but our issue wasn't so much in the box. It was just everything. And I think the, the, the better argument would have been why was Havertz not used up front in this game? Because, you know, even though he, he got a yellow card and some would argue it could have been a red card, um, for me, that was one of his better performances, but it's like the bar's on the floor. Hmm. So anything positive he did would, would be seen as good. So it was he did a better performance, but it wasn't anywhere near what we need from him, what we've been expecting from him for the money we paid and for the player that he's replaced. Yeah. In Granite Shaka. And, and I think that's the unfortunate thing. But yeah, that, that's what the manager could have done. You're right that we have an issue in terms of the forward line. My big thing is midfield. Not having Thomas Partey available again in the crunch, which means that we're gonna have Jorginho and Rice playing over and over again from now until January is ridiculous. Okay, Elneny can come in every now and again, but who really wants to play Elneny? None of us do. But he's gonna to have to play now because we don't have a choice. Um, and, and I think that's that's a, a mistake the club made in not addressing that position. You know Partey's not been reliable. He might be one of our best midfielders, and you could argue that he is our best holding midfielder. I think that's a fair argument to make. Rice is coming and is doing things really, really well, but there's things that Partey does that Rice can't or hasn't done so far. Let's not say he can't do, but hasn't done so far. And it's young, and he's young as well. He's still learning the game as well, so yeah. he'll only get better. But he's still I still learning that, the team as well. Yeah, but I still think that with the Partey thing, I heard that Partey wants to leave Arsenal in January. I, I don't know if he. I don't think he's injured. I feel like him and Arthur had a massive argument, and I feel that Arthur is not going to play him until January to get rid of him. I, I don't. I, I don't buy that. Because that, that hurts us more than it. It's not like when he's done it with Aubameyang and others where it's like, I'm going to freeze you out. Or like when, Ozil, it was needed. when he was just thinking out of joint, you said, okay, right, I'm not playing yeah. anymore because you're just not giving me enough intensity. I get that. But this would be really cutting off your nose to spite your face. Like, it doesn't make any sense to do that in this occasion, considering you're part of the reason why he stayed in the summer. With all the, you know, smoke around... The guy, yeah, it would have been easy to let him go in the summer, and there was an, there was a player that we were looking at to bring in, and we chose not to do it this summer. Who was that? I don't know who. But okay, I know that was, that was a player we were looking. We were looking at a player in midfield, so the argument now is: do we move that up and get that player in in January? It could be the Brazilian uh, that plays for Fluminense that we've we've scouted and we scouted him again recently in their game against um, Boca Juniors in the Libertadores final. Yeah, and they won that, um, didn't and they? And they won it, yeah. yeah. So it could be that guy. Um, whose name has escaped me. But yeah, I don't know specifics. Or oh, could be Doug, Doug, I mean, we heard Doug, Doug Luiz, Aston Villa. Yeah, I think he's well, a good player, he would yeah. do well. But for you, Matthew, nice. look, looking at that result, obviously we know the VAR situation was a bit of a fast, but like, yeah. what's your kind of take on how the game played out? Um, I think, uh, for, unfortunately, the thing that's going to be taken away from this is the whole VAR thing that dominated the whole game and still continues to dominate with the reactions of particularly Arteta and you know it didn't help in it didn't help two days later in our game VAR dominated again you know it's it's just making the league look a bit silly after all this it really does make we pride ourselves on being the best in this and that around the world but we can't get our VAR right so fortunately that's always going to be the dominating factor what it means for you guys is I think that your your new I think people start to question your ways. That if anything, they're questioning you more now than they were last year. This time of the season, I think this time last year you were a bit further ahead, you, where you were just going blowing teams away. Mm. But with this more methodical approach, it's almost like they're questioning like, and despite the progress you have made, because you have you know you have made progress in being harder to beat. You know, that your, your second time around is meant to be a, a bit of a better approach. But a lot of people have actually questioned Arteta and been like, why isn't doing this and doing that, despite arguably having a better team than they did last year. So and because you're judged on going towards the title, you know, every time you lose, it's, they're going to pick on, you know, for for something. But we can also just talk it down to a poor performance. And mm. also the fact that has he got a squad that's a bit, harder to manage not in the case of ego i'm talking in a place of performance because you've had raya in for a while and mm. you can see 
that this was one of his more forgettable performances. The thing that he did off the line against Newcastle was what caught him against him against Mudrick at Chelsea. He was in the wrong place and it went over his head. If he's on his right line, as a goalkeeper, you're getting that. You know, at the right place, his, his positioning was all off. You know, he's also got another number one starter in Ramsdale. Didn't have a great game against West Ham in last week in midweek. Mm -hmm. You know, Declan Rice, for as good as he is, you know, Partey still has that something that he doesn't. And the alternative is on any, which, let's be real, not great. And Ketia, who I have firm belief in who could be a really big star for you guys, he's doing it one minute against Sheffield United. Mm -hmm. He's got to be doing it against other teams. At least, you know, putting in and doing something. Come off as, like, say... Like you said, there's an impact sub and come off and try again and do something. If he wants to be that more established player and chasing someone like Rashford, which I think he can, he's capable of, he's got to be showing that a little bit more. You're chasing a title for sure this season. You're one of the two, maybe three teams going after a title. So something more, you know, is, has got to be done. Then there's a whole striker argument. You know, you're going after Tony or someone else. Is that going to be the final piece of the puzzle that makes you more complete from last year and is going on a tear in this league? Don't get me wrong, you've had good results. You've gotten over that city hoodoo, but there's always, you know, you've got other teams in the league that are chasing some sort of progress, like in Newcastle or stuff like that. So it's not an ideal result. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. You're still firmly in the right place. But it's like it's a it's a a, a fly in the, it's a fly in the ointment. It is a fly in the ointment. And what you don't want is for more flies to be dropping in that ointment to make you start worrying, you know, too much. But I think they'll be looking at Arteta a little bit more, putting him in a little bit more scrutiny in his decision-making, his subs, and just the players he has is that how is he going to manage their performances and who he starts and all those, all those different things. Like, yeah, it's your, your next game is what, Burnley? Burnley. So it shouldn't come yeah. up. Your ne when's your next like real like key fixture? Well, we've got Seville tonight, and then That's, Burnley. Next this in the could be the one tonight because this one I think defines whether you qualify or not. So. And then we've got um, European um, uh, the international break, break, so we can all rest up there. Yeah, um, but I think what's also interesting as well, this uh, just in on light in light with the VAR controversy and stuff, the League Managers Association. That's what basically comprises all the teams, the managers. They have spoken to Premier League... Uh, sorry, the LMA have revealed that Premier League bosses are demanding changes to VAR after Mikel Arteta and Arsenal spoke out. You know, we are spearheads in this world. <laughs> about the poor and inconsistent standards. And they are calling for two key things. The first one is that a VAR specialist should be considered a member of the close team of officials that become one unit for every game they are officiating together. So basically, if you're going to have VAR, there's a specialist to oversee the whole thing, not some Muppets in there. And number two, <laughs> and most importantly, for a review and simplification of the interpretation of clear and obvious error in the VAR decision-making process, as it's just causing too much confusion. Because time and time again, this whole clear and obvious is the problem where they're not doing stuff. It's especially the issue in the Liverpool Spurs game yeah. when they said VAR check... Goal. Yeah, or VAR yeah. check, check complete, because he thought he gave it as a goal and he didn't. Yeah. Ridiculous. So I think that is good. They're clearing it up. Obviously, this push in the back of, of um, Gabriel. I'm sorry, if the guy's two hands are not there, he heads it away fine, no issue. There's been a few handballs that have been given. It's just like, is that really a clear, obvious error? The ball's really close to the guy. Can his hand get out of the way? There's been so many weird decisions. There's even one that you guys weren't given, which was called for a dive, hmm. in a game you played earlier in the season, which should have been given as a penalty yeah. for you. I remember that game really well, but I can't get a place who you were I, can't remember, I remember it, but I can't remember who we were playing against. But the, the player got caught. Because he went down easily, they didn't give it. So yeah. I'm just hopeful that, that these changes come into place and help make things a lot and you better. Could talk, you could talk about these things going on from years previous. Yeah, but we just want to focus on this season. Because if I go, if we keep going back, my head will boil. Old Trafford, Martinelli, Erdegaard's foul on Ericsson, which took 15 replays, five slow motions, and four alternative angles. Nonsense. Stamford Bridge, Cucurella's hair. Nonsense. Mm. So we'll leave it there, and we'll see how we all get on in the weekend's fixtures. This is us signing out. Have a good rest of the week, and we'll see you all next time. Peace. Peace.